on behalf of the social family and on behalf of the Nehru Center, I welcome you all to the third J.P. Sutra Memorial Lecture. The first one was held here, Justice Dr. Patel delivered the first lecture. The second one was online, and this is the third. Uh, I am personally very happy to see all of you because after the gap of almost two and a half years, uh, we are having some footfall in the new sector. So thank you all for being here. Mr. J. Nisusa was a living legend, a public servant in the background of the Navy, Royal Navy. He was an exceptional public servant who primarily asked a question. Public servants are supposed to serve the public or the political edge And he stood for the former. Every department that he served, he was like a conscience speaker. And if the situation so demanded, he stood up to the political institute. It is often said by many juniors who probably never even saw Mr. Jesusa. That those were different times. Even the class and quality of the people who were in the political executive was much better, much superior. Maybe to some extent it is true. But a public servant, when he gets into it, whether he is a member of the Indian Administrative Service, or Allied Services or any other service. His primary allegiance is the Constitution of India and to the law of the land. And this he should not and must not ever forget. And that is what Sadat Patel in his first address to the first batch of the directly recruited IS officer, he has said that a public servant can never afford to get involved in the political values. The day he does so, he debases the service. Somewhere down the line, I think, uh, we, we misinterpreted our job. We abdicated our responsibility to give correct advice. And when that happens, one remembers this man. Many of you may have known him. I have known him personally. While in service and even outside the service. And he was a retired person. And I'll just give you one instance that how simple he was and how law abiding he was himself. He had a weapon. And that weapon license had to be renewed periodically, perhaps after a few years. The rules of business say that the license holder must personally come with his weapon to the licensing authority and get the license renewed. Mr. D'Souza was the only person, a person who had been the Chief Secretary of the State, who would personally come 
to the commissioner's office, go directly to the branch which renews the license, get the license renewed and then come out to say hello to the commissioner. And the commissioner will be so embarrassed, sir, why did you come, why did you do that? He said, no, this is what the rules say and this is what I shall do. He was, he was quintessential a public servant and I wish the younger generations try to imbibe something <coughs> what he said. Thank you so much. May I request Dr. Ravi? Welcome to the third JV Tuzuka Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm Ravi, the eldest child of Mr. JV Tuzuka. Uh, a few words about my father, though Mrs. Sani has very kindly said a lot about him, but a few words about my father, uh, his career, and his life. He uh, was known as a civil servant, uh, remembered as a civil servant, and he belonged to the very first IS batch of 19. Uh, my father had many different positions in, the, in his 32 year long uh, career and in as a civil servant. But before joining the IAS, he served in the Royal Indian Navy for two years during World War II. His first assignment in the IAS was to look after refugees in the, uh, Punjab immediately after partition, and he later worked in. The Nawada district of Bihar. Uh, he later moved, after this, he moved to Maharashtra and he served as a collector of Bombay and Kulaba. Uh, he was a divisional commissioner of uh, Aurangabad. He was general manager of BSC, <coughs> uh, municipal commissioner of Bombay, chief secretary of Maharashtra, and he retired from the IS in 1979 as secretary uh, government of India and the Ministry of Works and Housing. After retiring from government service, he took up uh, several jobs and assignments, and uh, some of the important ones were he was the principal of the Administrative Staff College of India in Hyderabad, and he was also an advisor to the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, he believed in working actively even after the retirement. In fact, he didn't believe in a work for retirement, and he worked right up to 2007, uh, 2007 when he passed away at the age of 86. Although he was he is, uh, remembered at mainly as a civil servant, my father had uh, uh, many different hats, so, so to speak, uh, in his life and in his career. Uh, some of these were, uh, he was a sailor, <coughs> an administrator, a chief executive, a manager, an activist, a civil rights campaigner and also a writer. There may be a few others also, but my father was a very versatile man and uh, um, he was interested in many different uh, issues. He was upright and took up several unpopular causes, uh, politically unpopular especially, yeah. and uh, including taking on the state government and uh, very powerful politicians. And at the same time, to all of us, who, his family and others who knew him well, he had a very uh, good sense of humor. He was always very self-deprecating. And uh, we, many of us, uh, and many of his friends remember that also, that side of him. So that was my father. And uh, though 16 years have passed since he passed away, we all remember him, all of us who family and uh, uh, his, his friends all remember him with a lot of affection and respect and love. Um, so that was my father and now a few words about uh, today's speaker, Pei Rasulha. Uh, Pei was born in Chikbangaroo 
in Karnataka and she studied at Mount Carmel College in Bangalore where she uh, did journalism <laughs> and English literature. Later she did her master's in mass communication. Uh, we started her journalism, uh, uh, her media career with All India Radio and then later with CNBC. Uh, she had a weekly show on ET Now uh, dealing with personal and insurance and personal finance and insurance matter. She is uh, best known for her uh, anchorship of Mirror Now. Uh, she ran the channel, the channel uh, and it was an English channel of the part of the Times group. She hosted the urban debate show to highlight apathy, inefficiency and corruption in every day life of India. Um, <coughs> after leaving Nirana in 2019, Fay joined a short format uh, online video portal uh, where she presents current news under her own name. Uh, she has she is a recipient of uh, awards. 2018 she was awarded the Reading Award as the Analyst of the Year. In 2021, she was uh, given the Agent of Change Award and in 2022, she was given the Ramna Goenka Award for uh, her co uh, coverage during the COVID uh, epidemic. Now, we, to all of us who know, uh, have watched up a channel of uh, uh, YouTube uh, and other portal. She belongs to a shrinking breed of independent journalists who question and who are not afraid to uh, are not afraid to question and hold up, uh, and hold those in power to account. Uh, this, these are a few words about faith. Uh, I would like to thank her on behalf of the Dissula family for very graciously and immediately accepting uh, our request to be uh, to, to deliver the third JB Dissula memorial lecture. Thank you very much, Faith. Thank you all for coming. It's true, I agreed very readily when uh, I was invited to this event. I'm so intimidated by all of you now, I thought maybe I made the wrong decision. <laughs> I've gone through a little more. Um, I don't believe I'm qualified to speak to this room, so I beg your indulgence for the next few minutes as I just make my point as to what I wanted to say. Um, when I was asked uh, to present this, I won't call it a lecture, it doesn't qualify, when I was asked to present this, uh, this talk to you, I had conversations uh, with the D'Souza family on what the subject matter should be. And we came up with this, Three Stones of Giants, and I'll tell you why. There's a film called Good Night and Good Luck. It's based on the life of Edward Murrow, who was a journalist, was a journalist in the 1950s, who took on some very powerful people. In that film, there's a dialogue in which his career is described as throwing stones at giants, as to what he did, because that is what journalists are supposed to do. You were supposed to, from your very small position, constantly take on people in power. And I felt, uh, while I was talking to the family of Mr. J.B. Souza, that it sounded like that is what he did through his career, he constantly took on people who were more powerful than him and he didn't let that lopsided power intimidate him. Unfortunately, our names are the only thing I have in common. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some people in the back asked me if I'm related. Um, I would like to say yes, but the answer really is no. <laughs> but I do believe that there are some things as journalists we should have in common with it. The ability and the spine to throw stones at giants. The belief that we serve the people and we work in public service. The allegiance to the constitution and not to government. And certainly not to a political party or to politicians. This was the iron structure on which 
Sardar Patel believed we were building India in the IIS. And I believe the journalists who formed that fourth pillar of our democracy need to also be part of that structure without fear or failure. So that's how we came up with this subject matter of throwing stones at giants. While we discuss what ails the Indian news media, what's wrong with it. I mean, someone asked me, would you talk about what's right with it? And I said, that would be a really short talk. <laughs> <laughs> if I talk about what's wrong with it, we can go on for a little longer. Uh, and maybe also talk about, as active citizens who deeply love our democracy, which is why I know many of you are here, what we can perhaps do to help a solution, if there is one. So, while I thank you all for spending your tracking across the city from wherever you live to be here this evening, uh, I want to thank the Pusuza family for inviting me uh, and giving me this space. Uh, thank you to all of our audience members for giving me your kind listen. Traditional news media, which I describe as newspapers and television, are facing the onslaught of digital news. Uh, even for those people in the audience who told me that you don't use digital news or you're uh, illiterate of the digital news, it's right now threatening um, news as the traditional news as we know it. Many people, most of the young people, I'm sure several, several of you at home, no longer have that cable connection. Where you watch TV, you're watching Netflix, and you're watching Amazon Prime, and you're watching things on your phone. Um, many, many young people I know don't read newspapers because it's inconvenient. They don't even, I mean, it comes home in India and it's just flopped on the table and it's exactly like that when it winds up in the pile. Hardly anyone opens it anymore. Um, to make matters worse, the traditional media is suffering from a crisis of credibility um, across the board. There is deep mistrust among the audience members as to why television behaves the way it does, why it is monotone and constantly simply mounts whatever the government asks it to, and why there's hardly ever another point of view. There's a crisis in advertising revenue as well because most corporates have figured out that they can spend less money on digital to reach a larger audience than having to spend money on television and on print, which means this is an expensive business and you're not making enough money and you're chasing a shrinking pie, which makes everybody in this business more and more desperate. For those people who are attempting to throw stones, there is obviously the enforcement directorate that regularly collects rates, um, and the income tax department, and the GST department, and all of these wonderful agencies who will remind you who's boss on a regular basis. Um, and if you don't get that message, there is the IT cell on the internet that mercilessly <coughs> trolls, intimidates, and threatens people to take on government and the dependency on government advertisers. I mean, everybody knows that the most expensive advertising in the country is the front page of our newspapers. It should never be an ad. It's, it was pioneered by the Times of India, now everybody does it. And now you could open your ad paper and go one page, two page, three page of ads before you read any sort of news. But what I want to bring to your attention is when was the last time you saw soap being advertised on the front page of the, of the newspaper, or Big Bazaar, or a car. All the advertisements are now coming from governments. They are the big spenders. So you have a business that's hard to run, an audience that's shrinking. And the hand that is feeding you is not the hand that you want to bet. Which is why there are very few people who want to take on the government from inside of the structures that are built in traditional media. As far as the shrinking audience is concerned and the desperate need to hold on to them, we are now left with this. These are all real things that happen on television. News. <laughs> This corner was last week. Yes. <laughs> this is what this is what news media is having to do in order to hold people's attention. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're sitting here in the comfort of this room laughing about it, but it should make us cry. Because it's so sad that these people think it's okay to do this. 
or these people think that it's necessary to do this. Which means that they place absolutely no value in the information and absolutely no value in the facts of what they're delivering. Which means there are teams of people sitting around in these newsrooms discussing ideas, coming up with this, as a way to hold attention of their audience. Because at the end of the day, advertisers and media right now don't care how you got your TRPs. They just go for the person with the highest TRPs. So it no longer matters for the person who is buying what these people are doing to hold your attention. And the first thing I'd like to communicate when we start off is when you're watching television news, to remind yourself that you are not the customer of this service. You are the commodity. The customer is the advertiser. They're creating a product the advertiser will want to buy. You are the commodity that they are selling. Your attention span is what is being cut up, packaged and sold. So all they're interested in is making you watch as long as possible. We have something as a, as a terminology called time spent when they measure TRPs. It's after you switch on your television, how long they can get you to stay. That is time spent. This is how they're doing it, unfortunately. There are other ways they do it. Paid speech, loud debates, or what they call debates, fighting with each other, breaking news constantly. There is, for example, one tactic that television channels use where something happens at 2 o'clock and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you just pick up that story and break it again. Because the audience needs to feel that there's constantly something happening or they won't watch. How else could you have 24 by 7 breaking news all the time? It's not possible. Unless you break the same story over and over again. Effectively, you're lying to your audience and telling them at 4 o'clock something that happened two hours earlier. There is a list of ethics that prevent them from doing that, but obviously nobody cares anymore because nobody's checking anymore. We could ask ourselves, what's, so what's wrong? Right? It's a business. This is what everybody does. Not if it's journalism, what you're doing. If you're entertainment, then that's okay. Then you can do what the key series does, which is basically like slap someone for 20 minutes and make that entertaining. <laughs> and that's okay, because there's no work of ethics when you're writing fiction. But in journalism, in this I pulled out, this is the fundamental definition of journalism that they teach you on the first day of journalism school. You shouldn't have to refresh it, but unfortunately here we are. The first point is accuracy. Journalism necessarily needs to fit into the non-fiction category. <laughs> Which a lot of people seem to have forgotten. In many cases, they're just making stuff up at this point. Independence, when you're not dependent on any one particular source for money. When you're impartial, without fear and favor. Focused on humanity, and this is really important, and people tend to forget this. That because journalism is in public service, it needs to necessarily focus on the weakest person because that story needs to be told. Uh, our law tells us that every single individual in this country is equal. And everybody's, if there's one person in discomfort that needs to be taken note of, if there's one person whose rights are being violated, that needs to be taken note of. You don't need to be the majority in order to be heard. Journalists are meant to facilitate the voices of the weakest, the voices of the disenfranchised, the voices of the communities that are underserved, those who need the justice and who are not getting it. And of course they have to be accountable to themselves, to the audience who they serve, to the constitution, and not, like I said, to government. Now, I can take you through various problems of how this is not being done piece by piece. This is an example I take on a regular basis. If you remember when um, the late actress Sri Devi passed away in Dubai. Everybody put out these shows speculating about how she did it. And whether the bathtub was big enough to have actually drowned her. And they made these graphics and they got into bathtubs and they did all kinds of despicable things. And I'm bringing up this, this example because it's not a political example, right? It's not about whether it was BJP or Congress or 
what they were sending. This is a non-political example. This went on for two days. And I remember because I was at Mirodao and I had a colleague who came up to me and we tried to find evidence of foul play. There was none. All we could find at that time from the was a death certificate that said accidental death by drowning. That's all it said. And so that night we did not, I did not do a show on this matter. I did something else. And nobody watched my show. Rating was zero. But I had a colleague who came up to me and she said, but what happens tomorrow if it turns out to be murder, you'll be so embarrassed. And I said, tomorrow if it turns out to be, we will report it tomorrow. Because it is not the job of the media to speculate on what may have happened. They are only supposed to report what has happened when they have evidence and they are able to fact check that. And the reason why I bring this up is because it has been several years since this happened. And no evidence has emerged of foul play. No evidence has emerged of any sort of murder. None of these guys have apologized or taken any accountability for what they did that night. And they did it only for the ratings of one night. That was it. They tarnished the legacy of someone who had worked her entire career. They deeply hurt a family that was already in grieving. And they showed no accountability, all for one night's ratings. And you just move on as if nothing happened. And that's not okay. Independence. In the first photograph, <laughs> the gentleman who's being carried is allegedly a journalist. <laughs> the gentleman who's doing the carrying is the founder of a very large FNCG company. This doesn't seem like he's going to be held accountable for the various problems of the products in his company by the journalist he is currently cradling in his arms. <laughs> that was pre-COVID. During COVID, the founder of the FMCG company was given free reign to come on to national television channels and talk about how jalibutis can help you fight COVID. He was then allowed to launch a product for which he got permission from the government, which is a completely different story. But again, he was given free reign on television channels to hawk his product without any fact check, without any sort of due diligence, because the company that he runs is a big advertiser. He spent a lot of money at a time when other companies don't have money to spend. And just the progression of these three photographs will show you that the independence is perhaps nowhere to be found in these organizations. Impartial, without fear and favor. These are numbers that uh, the government has presented before Parliament on the amount of money it spends in advertising. I have to point out here that post 2019, after winning the next the, the election, the spend has come down year by year. But we are going through into another election next year for an uh, industry and this that is completely starved for any sort of business. This is a lot of money. So not only is it those big ads, but also the tender notices that get placed in newspapers. Conclaves that uh, big television networks do, they're constantly doing these conclaves. They do these conclaves because government ministers agree to attend and speak. And then various PSU organizations sponsor. And if you fall out of favor with government, the ministers will not attend. And the PSU organizations will not sponsor. And so a large amount of revenue will then get cut. And it is widely documented that when organizations throw stones at giants and ask uncomfortable questions, the advertising gets withdrawn. And then it becomes really difficult to survive. Which is why the bigger the organization, the more they need a slice of this pie, the less likely they are to ask uncomfortable questions. We had our wrestlers sit 
on the streets in Jantar Mandir for over a month. India has a handful of Olympic medals, two of them were protesting for a month and nobody asked questions. The media in fact went out of its way to tarnish these protesting messages. Manipur has been burning for 50 days. Nobody is asking a question. I mean, I would, God forbid, but I want you to imagine if it was Maharashtra instead of Manipur. Burning for 50 days. Loot, plunder, murder. There was a large number of ammunition and rifles brought in by the armed forces to maintain peace that was stolen by the people and used to cause more pain. Stolen from the armed forces. <coughs> Who is going to ask that question? And who is going to answer that question? The state government continues to function. The state, the chief minister actually put out spaces and appealed to people to please give our guns back. <laughs> You're laughing at this now because it was not on the front page of your newspaper and it should have been. Someone should have asked that question. Someone should have said, are you kidding me? Are you telling me that India Vishwa Guru, leader of the world, can't bring peace in one state in a day if we choose to. What leader of the world are we hoping to do? How is this possible? How can this possibly be the case? In the year 2023, nobody is asking the right question. Nobody is speaking on behalf of the disenfranchised, of the people who don't have justice of the smaller communities. Because the only voice that you're hearing is the most powerful voice. Because it's using the media as a PR mechanism right now, which is why you're not able to hear the voices that you should be hearing. COVID. Most of us have blocked COVID out of our minds because it was such a traumatic experience for every single Indian. But shocking things happened during COVID. Terrible decisions were taken, repeatedly. Nobody asked those questions. Money was spent without accountability. Lockdowns were called, lockdowns were removed. Bodies were flung into the river. IPI continued to be held while people were dying just outside in Delhi in the second year. There was no oxygen. People had to go to court. To ask for oxygen. Hospitals were full. When I regularly told we did an excellent job, someone needs to wake up the dead and tell them that we did an excellent job. But at that time, nobody asked questions. Nobody asked questions after that. Nobody is asking questions now of where is the PM Cares fund? Where did that money go? How much money was it? Did we spend it? Did we not spend it? Who kept it? Demonetization. People die. We still don't have a white paper, research paper as to who approved it, why they approved it, what happened then. What were the goals, were any of those goals achieved? But nobody is asking those questions. Because nobody is serving those 110 people who died during demonetization. Nobody is asking the questions about COVID. And how many people actually did die during COVID and if we have those accurate numbers. The Odisha train tragedy in Balasov. The last story, and this was written by the Deccan Herald, about the NDRF, the disaster relief team that went to help, and were pulling bodies out of the wreckage, were traumatized. They could neither eat nor sleep for days. And mental health professionals had to be flown in to help them. This is NDRF, this is their job. It was so traumatic that they couldn't move on from it. The Indian media wrapped up that story in three days. Nobody's talking about it. It was on the front page of the New York Times because that is how severe that accident was. Everybody has just 
moved on. There was a school in Balasaur that was used as a makeshift mob for bodies were laid out. That school had to be demolished because the children refused to go in. It was that traumatic. There were nearly a hundred bodies that were not claimed at all. You don't know what happened to them because nobody's asking those questions anymore. The death rate went up and was brought back down the next day. Nobody is asking those questions. Nobody is speaking up, speaking up for the neighbors who were in that train. Unfortunately, like it always happens in our country, the people who died were among the poorest, the voiceless, whose lives are distancing. A part, a large part of what media does is to foster public debate. I don't have to finish that sentence. <laughs> There are very few newspapers in which the columns are still asking hard questions and the, the editorials are still asking hard questions. Television is out of the question. They literally make space for the government voices to shut down everybody else. The government voices have become so confident now that they regularly indulge in hate speech on national television with no consequence and complete impunity. There is no public debate. I was just telling someone that there needs to be a place a safe place where you can say, hey, but hang on, why is the U.S. rolling out the red carpet? And someone can answer that question for you because that is what news media is supposed to do. So that you understand it better. But there is no safe place in this country where you can ask that question without being shouted down on and being called a national or an anti-national for simply doubting or for simply asking. But the fundamental basis of being in a democracy is that you are able to doubt. It is your right to ask, and it is your right to receive the answer as information, none of which is happening today because the media and that fourth pillar has crumbled. Accountability. We all remember there was a time when newspapers had to print at the bottom, but they had made an error. Television channels had to write the book, retracting something because they made an error. When was the last time? We saw one of them do that. And I just pointed out several problems. And they regularly pick up completely false fake news from WhatsApp and run it as real news on television and then not bother to apologize at all. Part of the ethics is to minimize harm because journalism is that fine line between privacy and public good. If you cover an individual in public good, but you have to also minimize the harm to that individual. And I want to present before you Aryan Khan, Shah Rukh Khan's son who spent over 20 days in jail for doing absolutely nothing. He had done nothing wrong. The court threw out the case completely for the lack of evidence. But no one in the media asked that question. Instead, they made a complete circus out of that opportunity. Whereas if the media had asked that question accurately and pointedly at the right time, that case would have fallen apart in two days. Or a week. Or two weeks. Which is when the Narcotics Bureau presented their evidence before court and everybody realized they had nothing. But nobody asked that question because nobody was attempting to minimize that damage. Also, the government cannot regulate the media because it already has a large amount of influence, the media is required to regulate itself. Which means it has to be accountable to itself. It has to be accountable to a self-regulating body and it has to be accountable to its audience. None of which it is choosing to do right now because at this point, if you say and do whatever the government asks you to do, then no harm can come to you. What can we do now? There are many, 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 many journalists all across the country who are functioning as independents who are still doing really hard work. You know who they are because you come across their work on a regular basis. The structures now allow you to support those journalists directly with patronage, with, with the ability to pay for the content that they're putting out. Some uh, organizations actually run campaigns saying, hey, we're going to cover this particular election give us money so that we can send our journalists out because it's an expensive prospect. <coughs> you can actually 
choose good journalists that you want to support. You can support them with subscriptions, with memberships, with your patronage, and you can pull the plug on those who don't treat you with respect. Because, like I said in the beginning, you are the commodity, not the customer. But you have the ability to turn it off. You have the ability to withdraw your subscription, <coughs> to no longer be a guinea pig to the content that they're putting out. Because every time you watch, they get TRPs, every time they get TRPs, they make more money, and they, you're just reinforcing bad behavior. A shameless plug, that's the organization that I run. <laughs> we just launched an app. Um, uh, the aim of our app is to be able to put out news without any opinion and any trolling, um, so that you can just find out what's going on without having to read through the heat. Please take a look at our app and download it if you can. Today, the Chief Minister of Assam targeted the President, ex, the former President of the United States, Barack Obama, by saying, We have many Hussein Obamas in India whom the Assam police will take care of. What do the media say about that? Well, I think that this, we've seen politicians do this on a regular basis where they, they use the them versus us, us versus them part, and other the other person immediately at least because Barack Obama put out uh, a statement in an interview that if he were to have a conversation with the Prime Minister only he would ask questions about human rights. Uh, this was in, in response to that, but I mean, what else would we expect from the Chief Minister of Assam? He's built his career on statements like this. Yet he remains Chief Minister. Continuation of um, what you said, which is to support independent media. Do you see a BBC kind of model working in India at all? Or as you said, you know, media can self-regulate if it wants. So we do have a BBC model, it's called Good Question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's exactly that. And all in the radio. So Sarvati is Exactly what the BBC yeah, but that is to know, but that is still with government funding. Whereas the BBC model does That's not have government funding, it is the homeowners who pay a TV tax, and that goes to BBC. Yeah. No, the BBC is government funded. No, 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 no. It is TV tax. I mean, the fact that the BBC will still for eight hours run the coronation of that King Charles and not yes. ask questions. Well, that is an editorial. Yeah. No, the BBC, is, has, the BBC is the British version of Prasad Bharti. That's exactly how it functions. It is, uh, it, it is government funded, but it's government funded in public service. And they regularly have a push and pull between the editors of the, B, the BBC and, and their government about what has been done and what is not. So it depends on the, um, you know, the personal sort of spine of each editor and that battle continues. Hi, thank you, Faye, for giving uh, this little presentation on the state of the situation today. Uh, my name is Ruth Chisuza. Uh, I've been uh, quite dismayed in the past, I think all of us have in the last few years, to see how the space uh, for dialogue has uh, disappeared. Uh, that's your comment. And how can we really reclaim the space? The second is, you see channel after channel being bought by media tycoons and uh, uh, the latest was Sarah Jacob uh, who was, uh, and almost everyone was, uh, who, had his, who had a show was thrown out in their TV. So you see that what is left uh, of the media is crap, it's not worth watching at all and I have stopped watching for the last at least three years. Uh, the last was NDTV and after that, uh, no way. So how do you, uh, you know, I mean, how do, how do you, uh, you know, counter this uh, is a second question. The third, you know, when it comes to independent, I support some of these journalists, but you see that you have Ravish Kumar running his own thing, uh, Karan Thakur, Barkha, uh, you, everyone is running their own thing. Is there any way where independent people like you can also come together on a platform and that this platform can 
please support him so that you know you are not operating independently you can't be targeted independently and there is some strength uh, you know in being together sure um, i think the reason why most people are still functioning independently is because then you have you take responsibility for your own work and as soon as you get clubbed with other people then you have to in some way be accountable for their politics as well or whatever work they are putting out that that becomes slightly tricky in this market also being independent means our costs can be very very low and it makes it easier to run these businesses uh, there are some attempts being made to club people together to um, you know to sort of collaborate a lot of us are part of an organization called the digi publishers association digital publishers association where we share legal fees when we get notices and you know uh, things like that so we we have a team of pro bono lawyers who help us out there. so there is some collaboration happening on the back end on the front end we still have to figure out how to make that happen uh, you know as well in terms of i mean i honestly think that the television news business model no longer supports journalism and so what's happening on television news is no longer journalism mm -hmm. and i would just leave it at that I mean, if you Do want you to think it would ever come back any possibility <coughs> it's so corrupted <coughs> now and the viewers have got so used to a so different it's, model it's, uh, it's many things in india <coughs> i have pointed out all of the things that are happening but there are seven several seven things we share with what's happening on the as well digital news is turning even away from television um, no one's watching the traditional feed anymore even if people are watching television news they're watching it on their phones and their computers so which means that when you do that the revenue on youtube is much lower than they will make if you were to watch it on your tata sky so there is a disruption happening in the way content is being delivered to you because people are moving to their phones and they find it more convenient so all over the world we have to find a solution to this problem it might take longer than maybe i am sure television will survive because this is what was said of radio when television came around there were radio shows dying out it's a big reason for tv but radio didn't die it still exists in some forms so i'm sure when all of this is done television will continue to exist in some form but hopefully not the form that we have it right now Hi, my name is Ishika, and um, so something I worry about is the polarization that we see in um, traditional media. I mean, there's a very typical kind of people who would watch Anand Goswami's show. I wanted to ask you: Do you think that polarization is also coming to independent journalism? Because, um, of course, like a lot of people my age, I do follow you on Instagram, and I'm very used to. Um, you know the typical gray square with the black letters and i do see in the comment section a lot of people do agree with what you are saying and they agree with each other and i i i don't know i think even with say an app like this it's again going to be a very similar kind of people who will download that app and engage with that content and at the same time what i see is a complete shrinking of something like um, long form journalism or <coughs> Even something like an op-ed. I remember when that report had come out of India, occupying a very low rank on the happiness index. Uh, I, I do still read the Times of India, and I opened it up, and there was a column there by Chetan Bhagat, and all he said again and again was, um, "Oh no, there's Syria out there, there's Bangladesh, those countries. Uh, I mean, you know, how are they higher up than India?" But no one was questioning why India occupies such a low rank. And um, I, I also belong to, I and mean, we are a very young population, and I'm part of that demographic. But you, you know, what I see is very similar conversations amongst one kind of echo chamber, and you know, we get tired of things like Times of India or Anand Goswami, and we flock to your Instagram comment section, and we sort of comfort each other. But do you think, with something like Be True, do you think it has the uh, potential to reach? the people who are reading Chetan Bhagat's columns and you know I mean do you think it could break that polarization in any way do you think there's potential yeah, so, so, so your, your point is that there are echo chambers being formed where people of yeah. similar views are just Complicated, you know, yeah. doing what they call uh, bias confirmation where I already believe something and I only read what makes me feel better about what I believe 
Um, the idea with the app that we've launched is that we're just putting out the news. There's no opinion at all. So, I mean, and there are checks and balances I put in place to make sure that this, we're also connecting for our own personal biases when you're writing that news. So I'm hoping that over a period of time, people will realize that this, you can't even find an echo chamber because you can't tell what, what side it's on. Um, but I think, and this is just me, and I open this up for uh, you, anyone who has an opinion, I think people are getting tired of the hate. I genuinely believe that we're reaching a point where regular, ordinary citizens on both sides of the aisle are tired. And they no longer want to hate each other. <laughs> and you just, you know, you just want to move on with your lives because I don't think there's been any point in the history of our country where politics has occupied so much mind space in the lives of average citizens over our dinner tables. I think we're all just exhausted at this point. And we just want to live our lives and eat our dinner and not have to like, hate on someone. And I think that may be a start to people just cleaning up, you know, conversations, deleting groups on WhatsApp, <laughs> to exiting, uh, you know, hateful spaces and finding nicer places to talk. So I want to believe that that is true. Anyone who has a different opinion, please. But Uh, hi, I want to know what uh, what we say to young people who want to take up journalism as a profession. Today? What do they have to look forward to? You know, because I see journalism schools. You know, there are uh, journalism schools which are struggling to get students for the graduate year. Nobody is wanting, nobody wants to sign up. Uh, the only courses they get uh, students for is advertising in PR. Nobody wants to get into hardcore journalism and uh, classroom then. So is there anything to look forward to and like, I mean, how would you encourage them? I mean, what was going through your mind when you started of studying journalism? Did you know? have hope at that point of time and would a young person today feel that there is any hope for you? Right? You know, journalism is all that is going on around. So how would you motivate young people to take up this as a profession? So I have hope today, sir. Uh, I'm still a hopeless romantic when it comes to our democracy. I believe we can post correct. I have hope today. I believe young people should become journalists, just like young people will join the army because they believe the country needs it. Just like young people become lawyers because they believe in justice. Or they join the IS because they want to serve. I believe journalism is a similar profession and we should encourage bright young people to become journalists because if they don't, then we are in trouble. For those who want to become journalists, I would say choose your first job based on the editor and not the brand. Because your first editor will either fill you with hope or crush your spirit. And you know, if, if you find a good editor who will teach you the profession and teach you the ethics and fill you with hope, and will give you what you need to fight for the next 20, 30 years. I think that we should get a lot of young people to become journalists. Um, I don't know how many people remember that when Gandhi came to India from South Africa to be part of our fight for freedom, he traveled into the country by train a lot and wrote about it and sent dispatches back. In my mind, that was journalism. I think that a lot of our battles were fought on the backs of good work. We survived the emergency. <coughs> the journalists did good work. I don't believe that this time is in any way darker than that time or that all is lost. Please tell anyone who wants to be a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one more question? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Right. Good evening. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. My name is Christelle Canero Alfonso. I'm interested in pursuing a career, career in journalism. <laughs> so, um, kind of journalists are under a lot of threat to report the news as for government perspective, and they do not their lives are in threat. False cases are made or the channel is shut down. So, how does one stand tall against all of this and actually report it to it as it is not making a full drama media circus out of it? Also, India's, as you might know, India's giant in the World Press Freedom Index has reached an all new low and has been slipping for the last few years. But yet, you don't see any media channel making of, you know, making, talking about it. 
Like even you know, the White House, the they you know, reported like why is the standard of journalism falling down? Or why is India is ranked like we're supposed to be the mother of democracy? Uh, yes. <laughs> and I'm sure we want to upmark this slipping down every year or if the survey is conducted. Okay, so to answer your first question, when you do become a journalist, you will be part of an organization which will have an editor who will make decisions. And if you choose the editor of the organization carefully, there are still many who are doing good work. So it's not all done. Um, I could help you with a list of names of people who think they're in touch with you, finish your course, who are still doing good work. And as a junior uh, in a newsroom, then you learn from those people, and they'll be the ones standing up to government and you know, making those tough decisions. So for many years you won't have to do it yourself. Um, you know, so you don't have to worry about that right now. Yes, our uh, press freedom index is dropping, our happiness index is dropping, our air quality index is dropping, <laughs> our index on maternal health is dropping. There are many things that, that, are, that are wrong, which is why we need journalists to ask those right questions. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, I'm Sahir, I'm one of the five grandchildren of J.B. D'Souza of Bain, as we knew him. And I'm here on behalf of my sister, my cousins, my parents, my aunts and uncles, and my grandmother Mila to thank you all and bid you goodbye. We're grateful that you spent this evening with us, remembering Bain in a way you could have appreciated, talking and thinking about issues that matter both to private lives and public environments, a mingling of the personal and the political. I'd like particularly to thank Faye D'Souza, a journalist I have admired for some years now. Uh, Faye, our family believes you espouse and embody ideals that being did too, honesty, good humor, and reliability. Thank you for your passionate and compassionate words. Uh, we want to thank Mr. Satish Tani and our friends at the Nehru Center for their hospitality again. And once again, to everyone who came here today, I thank you jointly and severally. Good night.